he said, I don't know. And I said, well, what's going to happen to the settlements? And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, what's going to happen to Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem, our Palestinians are going to finally be able to uh, worship at the holy sites. They're going to finally be able to go to Jerusalem. Is it going to be their capital? And what is going on with Jerusalem? And again, he said, I don't know. And I said, well, what about water? He said, I don't know. So what about the refugees? Are they finally going to be able to go back to their homes? Or what's the story? And again, he said, I don't know. And I said, well, what do you know then? And he said, all I know is that you've just given up the best thing that's, that's ever going to happen to, to, to you as a people. And with that, I woke up and decided that uh, I needed to move to Palestine. And I needed to perhaps try to do my share. Um, to at least help with the, with the struggle. Now, when I moved to Palestine, and one of the first things that I did uh, when I got there was I realized that if my friend, who's this left-wing, <coughs> self-proclaimed left-wing Israeli, um, was saying these things, then maybe other individuals were saying the same thing. And I, the more I started to talk to Israelis about what had gone on during the Oslo years, the more that I realized that it wasn't just me who had my head in the sand, but that the vast majority of people had their head in the sand about what was truly happening during the negotiations process. Now, um, so what I'm going to do is, with, with the slides, which, which you've seen this one has been out for a while, I'm going to sort of take you through what, what actually happened during the period of the negotiations and what's happening now, so that we can begin to see, or, or understand what it is that Israel is truly trying to do to the Palestinians. And again, I'm only focusing on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, but the exact same model is in place for the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Now, Israel's overall strategy towards the Palestinians is to try to confine them into as little space as possible and take as much land as possible. And you see this from even the Palestinian citizens of Israel. The Palestinian citizens of Israel are confined into small, uh, small cities such as Nazareth and Mephahim, surrounded by a sea of Israeli cities. No connectedness between the two cities, making it such that it's very difficult for Palestinians to purchase land, um, and that they, in effect, become confined, become isolated, subject to a whole host of discriminatory laws. But I'm, the rest of this talk is going to focus on the West Bank and uh, the Gaza Strip, so you can see how this all plays out. Now, the first slide that I've got coming up is um, that of, as I said, the West Bank. And you can see what's marked, which is areas A and B. Now, one of the things that happened during the Oslo Accords was that the critics kept saying the, this, this very point, which is that the negotiations process is going to serve to feed into Israel's bigger strategy of trying to confine the Palestinians, in, as many Palestinians, into as little space as possible and take the surrounding land. People didn't actually believe that, but at, the more that you see what, ha what actually happened during the negotiations process, you'll realize that the critics were actually right. Now, areas A and B are the areas that are, uh, in some way, shape, or form, under what's called Palestinian control. Now, it's a big myth to think that there's anything called Palestinian control. Um, Palestinian control, as you can see, from one area to the next, you have to you have to track. They're not. It's not sort of one big law that's controlled by by uh, the Palestinian Authority, but this sort of series of connect of, of disconnected islands. Now, in between all of those disconnected islands are the sea of Israeli settlements. Again, so the, the, the idea is confine the Palestinians into as little space and build as much land as possible. Now, during the period of the Oslo process, the Israelis, um, from my conversations with them, appeared that they had sort of two demands out of the Oslo process. And the first demand was that they wanted to have better uh, diplomatic relations entering into Oslo. They wanted no longer to be seen as a pariah state. Uh, they didn't want to be seen as this terrible occupier any longer. And the second demand that the Israelis had during the Oslo process was that they wanted better security. Now, on both of those fronts, Israel actually got what it wanted. Um, in terms of diplomatic relations, there were 34 separate countries that ended up signing peace agreements with, uh, sorry, establishing 
Washington diplomatic relations with Israel between the period of 1993 to the year 2000, directly as a result of their, that very famous handshake with Arafat. Um, they opened up trade offices from Oman to Morocco. There was a peace agreement that was signed with Jordan. All of this wouldn't have happened had it not been for that very famous handshake with Arafat. Now, on the issue of security, Israel also got security that rather than Israel now policing the streets of Palestine, they turned the Palestinian Authority into a sort of security subcontractor for the Israeli occupation. So, uh, which is ironically one of the, it's the first model in history, but not the only model in history, but the first model in history, where it suddenly becomes that the occupied people have to provide security for their occupier. And you can see that in those yellow areas that you see on the map, that's where the Palestinian Authority security forces were present. And the system largely worked. During the period of 1996 to the year 2000, late 96 to the year 2000, Israel had the most secure years of its existence. Now, Palestinians had one expectation, just one, which was that by 1999, they would be free. That the period of negotiations would actually lead to a process of de-occupation rather than an intensification of the occupation. It was a belief that uh, there, this process was actually going to lead to freedom for the Palestinians. What ended up happening was exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. The first was the territory suddenly became divided, as you see in those yellow areas. Uh, the second, and I'll talk about that shortly as we, as we go through more of the slides. But secondly, and the most important thing, was that these settlements ended up actually sp uh, springing up all over the place. The settler population from 1993 to the year 2000 actually doubled in size. It went from 200,000 settlers to 400,000 settlers in a seven year period, which was unprecedented. It, it far exceeded the, the rate of settlement construction from 1993 to the year 2000. So it's like those seven years was the, was the big push to build more and more and more settlements. As if the Oslo peace process suddenly gave Israel the green light and it pushed it and they went go and they began to expand and expand and expand and expand. So rather than it being a process of de-occupation, where Palestinians are now seeing that, there's, that they're going to be free, it ended up being feeding very much into this process of trying to confine the Palestinians into as little space as possible and take as much land as possible. Now, these settlements have continued to expand. They've continued to expand since 2000, and there are now roughly 500,000 settlers who are living in occupied territory. The settlers are not, uh, you know, Israel will have you believe that these are ideological settlers, they're not. Most of them have been economically incentivized to move in there. Everything from uh, income tax reduction, to better housing prices, to better schools, uh, better education facilities, and one of the things that you're going to see soon is better roads as well. Um, and, and a high percentage of Israelis have also indicated that they'd be willing to move out if they were given the right uh, amount of money. So in addition to, um, to the settlements themselves, during the period of Oslo, we then also had these things called military, closed military areas and military bases. So you can see again the process shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. The West Bank is becoming ever smaller, ever smaller. And suddenly sprang up this thing called nature reserves, which is that is these are areas that Palestinians can't build in because Israel's trying to preserve the environment. Now, if Israel were trying to preserve the environment so much, why is it that they're building um, factories in the West Bank that actually violate Israel's own environmental laws and using Palestinian labor to work 